So there's clearly some really great dress shops around here. Like, honestly, there's so many of you got really gorgeous. I usually wear dresses a bit like KP and I just, I've been watching and more and more people come in. I've asked a couple of you already, where'd you get that dress from? Um, it's a beautiful place here and um, we have been to lots of really remote places in Tassie um, and I flew in here last night and just thought, I wish I had more time to look around here. Um, and a few of the people that I've spoken to have said, oh yeah, I was born here, my kids are still here, my grandkids, like people stay, so aren't you clever? that you have settled here. And the other thing is that we keep hearing that services are fantastic, which we don't always hear when we go into remote areas, and I love hearing that. Um, I uh, grew up in Tassie, but worked in Melbourne in, uh, at St Vincent's in oncology, um, coming up for 30 years now. Um, and I moved back to Tassie eight years ago, and so I'm at UTAS half of the time in the Centre for Rural Health, just being dismayed about the rural health issues in Tassie. Um, but I still work at St Vincent's in Melbourne too um, and have enjoyed being part of BCNA for some time. Let me click on. Um, so I want to talk a bit about early stage breast cancer and what we understand are some of the processes that you go through um, with this diagnosis. I have never had cancer. Um, this has come from people that I've worked with and uh, it'll either resonate with you or you'll say that actually wasn't me and that's going to be helpful as well. Um, but one of the things that I think someone mentioned this morning um, is, you know, there's lots of stupid things that people say to you and one of them is that you're so strong and, oh, gosh, you're incredible that you've been able to still be coping with uh, a cancer diagnosis and actually... The fact is you never had a choice um, and you might be doing incredible things and I hope you have surprised yourself um, at how strong you are or how much you are able to ask for your own needs to be met and all that but um, I'm sure you would love to have not have to had had that um, pressure to get to that point but that is the case. When I have um, am uh, have someone referred to me who's really struggling, it's often because they are on this bit of the bridge of the transition. So I often think of really any change in life, um, going from not having children to having children, going from living in the country to moving to the city, um, not being married and being married, um, or none of those things might connect with any of you, or being someone without cancer to suddenly being thrown into someone with cancer means you have to cross this bridge, and I, use, I often use that metaphor, um, to what your new reality is. And the new reality can well involve all the, a whole lot of things that the old one um, happened to have. But we go from kind of who I am now and suddenly I'm on this bridge that I want to be on and a whole lot of the things that I was sure about, I'm now not sure about. So I might have had some goals for next year. I might have uh, known who my close friends are and who would be there for me. I might uh, feel like I know my body and, some, and then I'm put onto this bridge. I have no choice about it and I've got to cross over it to whatever um, it is on the other side. This is a really uncomfortable place to be. We as humans want to have surety. Um, and we kid ourselves all the time that we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, I, I have sort of had plans that we're going to have Christmas in Melbourne this year. Who am I to say I know what I'm going to be doing in December? But I do because I can still kid myself. Um, you can do a, a lot easier when you haven't had your life turned upside down by cancer. Um, but the re So the reality is that none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. And we do need to learn how to live in the now, but it's a horrible shock when that happens to you and suddenly you don't have a choice. Um, but of course, it's not a straight line, is it? Um, this is a road, it's the road, uh, the closest road for me if I wanna go skiing um, from, so I live in Launceston. So if you wanna go up to Mount Barrow, you have to go up this road, it's called Jacob's Ladder. And it's one lane, and when it's snowing, it's really icy. So if you're going up it and someone's coming down it, you have to reverse back into one of those corners. 
It's horrific. <laughs> I remember going up it as a child thinking it was really cool and there's great things to look at. I went up it um, in the back of a ute with my stupid mates that thought it was really funny to kind of, you know, swiggle around. And now I tend to not go up it because, of course, I'm older and wiser. Um, but actually the journey... No, I don't want to use the journey. Sorry, I use the journey word. <laughs> But it's much more like this, isn't it, than I'm on a bridge across here. So I want to tell you about a study that I was involved with in 2002. And what amazes me is that I think what we discovered then is still the case now. Um, and so what happened was I was working in an oncology service. I was working mostly with uh, people with early stage breast cancer. And my office was actually in day oncology, so I was very much, I saw people when they were diagnosed and through treatment, um, and I was around, like, you know, I had a sense of who was managing, who needed extra support. Um, but what happened was at about the, the, at that time there was a six week uh, follow up after treatment finished, and invariably the oncologist would ring me and say, can you see Mrs. Whoever? Um, or Mr. Whoever, um, because they were cope, they cope so well, and now they're crying. And I'm not sure if any of you are social workers in the room, but apparently that's what we do. We stop people crying. So the doctors <laughs> ring us, and my God, they're crying. Come on. <laughs> so we were kind of, you know, I was thinking that is interesting because you know I, I walked through some of that journey with that person. I use the word again. My God, it's because I don't want to use the word anymore that I'm it's jumping into my head. Um, and I, I did think to myself, okay, what, what is this that happens that the tears are coming more when treatment's finished? And so we did a study and we asked um, people who had finished early treatment for early stage breast cancer and their partners about what the journey had been like so we could understand it. So the first thing that they told us, so this is looking back, was that um, they went from being, the first transition was I'm a well person and suddenly I'm a cancer patient. And the experience was of complete shock and bewilderment. Um, and what I had to do then was manage this shock whilst having to make medical treatments pretty quickly. And what we know about shock is that you shouldn't make any decisions when you're in shock, but you don't have a choice. And the coping strategy was, I was trying to kind of work out how bad is this. So I'll give you a couple of quotes. One uh, woman said, it was one of those moments that will live on in life, it's scary. I hope I never have that moment again when she tells me it's cancer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about trauma later on. And we're understanding trauma much better these days. And we used to think that trauma was just, I've been in a major car accident. And so everyone goes, oh, yeah, that must have been traumatic. What we understand is trauma are these moments when something happens inside us and we never forget it. And so many of you will have that, that moment you heard those words. You were, it, it, had a feeling, okay. Another woman said she described the scene like a photographic still, the crying, the feeling of tears. Mum was at the end of the bed and she burst out crying and ran. And one of the things we know about trauma is that it's, we're very clever. So when we're faced with something that is completely overwhelming, first of all, we have this feeling and then something clicks in and it's almost like we're watching ourselves in a movie. And that's because we're really clever because we get kind of, um, held together um, even though we know that we're still being affected and we need to move on from it. And it can be really triggering to even hear that because you go, yeah, God, that is what it was like and I, but all I, had to, I had to keep going. So trauma is when an adverse um, experience happens and it overwhelms your ability to cope and your mind becomes flooded uh, with emotion and we often unconsciously stop feeling the trauma partway into it and we feel like we're watching ourselves in a movie um, even and the, the sound's been turned off. And the cost is that we've got this emotionally frozen part in our body and it usually doesn't get triggered till later on. Um, so I had this experience when I was in a tram going to work one morning, so at peak hour Melbourne in a tram going to some V's and I got a phone call to say my sister had died overnight. She'd not woken up. I remember being in the tram and having this 
terrible news and it hitting me and then thinking I'm in a tram and I have to hold it together and I need to let my mum know and I need to do A, B and C. Very similar to what many of you would have had happen. Um, and I, that is incredibly clever that we get held together so we don't completely fall apart. But of course at some point I then needed to go, what is the impact of that? Um, but but it's, it's completely unseen by everyone around you. So no one in that tram would have known that that had happened to me. Um, can I say, if I'd wanted to burst into tears and scream, that would have been totally reasonable too, totally reasonable reaction. But we often don't. We go, no, nope, I'm here, okay, doctor, you've told me this information. Generally, though, we don't hear anything after that sentence because we are in shock. Um, there's a really great writer, if any of you are interested in some of this work, called Gabor Maté, who's, who writes about trauma, and he says this brilliant sentence that really clicked for me. Trauma is not what happens to you, it's what it happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. It's that thing that happens inside us. And it can happen even, you know, when we're, we, we probably all have memories of when we're at school and we got yelled at by a teacher and we just felt this feeling and we still can remember it now. So it happens a lot of the time and it is unseen by anyone else around you. Okay, so then the women in this study said, so that was when I was diagnosed, then I went into treatment. And this was a lot of years ago, at least 20 years ago. Um, so there were certainly more harrowing treatments or less ability to cope with side effects, but I think it still is a bit like this anyway. So the experience was I just had to get through. So I had treatment in front of me and I was worried about all these other things, but it was like I was a racehorse and I just had those, you know, um, bl blind blinkers on and I have to go, I just have to get through. Can't think about this or that, I just have to get through. So I had to manage the really disrupted reality, the fact that people are dropping off another lasagna and I never really liked lasagnas in the beginning or you know I'm getting all these calls or whatever um, so the you know the household's really different at the moment I'm having to live with this uncertainty I'm having to adapt to all the changes and I'm coping with the impact on others so I'm really aware that um, my mother's you know tells me everything's fine but I know she's been crying whenever I see her or the kids are suddenly being really good or whatever it is, I'm aware, but we're not dealing with it because we've just got to get through treatment. Um, so the coping strategy was about avoidance. So I'm going to avoid how this feels because I have to just get through. So again, really clever strategy. Um, not thinking about treatments, having lots of people tell us as well as ourselves tell us that we're supposed to be thinking positively, even though we've just been handed an incredibly difficult thing to deal with. Um, focusing on tasks and maybe this is the time when there's more supports around us. People are calling, sending cards, whatever. Or maybe not. So a couple of quotes. Um, it was just awful, talking about chemotherapy. It was as bad or worse than I ever expected it to, to be. Every time you have a dose of chemo, it takes longer for your body to get better. It just, I just really couldn't see it ending. And then another person said, I was, during treatment I was in go forward mode. I didn't stop to think about what was really happening to me. <coughs> totally understandable. And then treatment finished. So the first thing was, what do I call myself now? Am I someone who had cancer? Am I someone who has cancer? Am I a survivor? Lots of people don't like that term. How do I, you know, if I meet someone new, how do I, what do I call myself now? There was a lot of relief that treatment had finished, but it's really mixed with ambivalence and fear. Um, I'm now beginning to process the experience that happened right back then. This, it's now, I'm able to start looking at it and that's why I'm more upset now than I was when I was holding it together during treatment. Um, and maybe start thinking about what does it mean for the future. The task was adapting to all of these changes in they might be values, attitudes, expectations, um, who's around, who's not around, and trying to work out, I know, what is my new reality, even though what I, what I really want is just life to get back to what it was before this happened. So I'm kind of looking back and appraising it and starting to kind of look forward and 
that's why it feels like an uncomfortable place, even though apparently I should be really grateful because treatment's finished and wasn't I lucky. Um, and some looking forward. So Claire said um, when she finished treatment, I can do cartwheels down the street. Annie said, whereas at the time of going through treatment, the time of being operated on and having all of that, it was a time when I didn't really think I ever really had cancer. Looking back, I think it was a bit unreal, whereas now it's becoming real. That doesn't surprise me at all. I've had other people say to me, I, I don't think I actually allowed myself to even go, I have cancer, because it was too scary when I was in the middle of that. And now, now I'm looking back and going, oh, God, OK, that is what I have faced and what I'm dealing with. Um, and I haven't... I don't think I've got a slide in here about partners, um, but... The partners had, you know, very similar but quite different um, level of emotion when they um, through all of those stages. So there was that bewilderment. Oh my God, what does this mean at the start? But then a whole lot of other pressures on. I've got to now. I've got to hold it together and, and answer the phone and deal with all of those things. And often partners would be at the point where treatment finished and they go, "Thank God." Life's going to get back to normal now. And then why is she crying more than she was then? Um, and one of the things is, of course, we, we set up partners terribly because we don't actually discuss that that's a part of the process and support them. So it's hard to process a trauma when you're going through it. And it's often when the initial crisis is over that we're able to consider what happened. And sometimes that's when it all starts to come and we are kind of going, wow, what does this all mean for me? So, of course, this bridge that I talked about, um, one of the big things is what's at the other end of the bridge and I so wish someone would just give me an answer. Um, and that's a, it's a hard place for us, um, for health professionals, because we can't give you answers that we know you desperately want. Um, and it's the reason why there is a lot of searching going on um, on the internet, because we just want someone to give us some clear how long... Is this finished? Is it? Can I get on with things now? When can I start not worrying? All of that, those questions that we desperately want answered. The fear of recurrence is the most normal thing in the world. So if you've had your life turned upside down, and you, especially when you didn't ever think that was going to happen, and then you have treatment and then you're being told that's all good, of course you're going to go, what if that happens again? Like that's really normal. So most people go through this. Um, and most people have a period where they're really aware of their body and every symptom that comes up. And most people, it just fades as they go along. If you find you're really stuck in it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies in a minute, um, then reach out um, for help because it, it is a really common thing and we, we are working with it um, better and better. But again, give yourself permission. Of course, that's going to be a fear because you had your life turned upside down. I want to talk a little bit about some of the other impacts that we're aware of and we probably don't do enough to support people with. And the first one is the impact on family. And I have always thought that cancer comes in the front door and it affects the whole family and that we should be providing services for the whole family. It's hard enough to get services for the person having treatment, but that is what I um, really believe. Um, when I say family here, I mean it very loosely, whoever the important people are in your, you know, whoever your tribe is. But I use this image of a mobile um, purposefully because these mobiles, first of all, they look a little bit like a family tree, but we know that they, they all hang off each other. And if I was to come along and flick that blue piece in the middle, um, all the pieces would move. And that's what happens to a family. And... They move differently usually. Some of them might spin around. Some might get caught up with each other. Um, some of them might just move a little bit, not even like we thought that they would. Um, but I would love the day when we are sitting with someone with a new diagnosis and we say, now, what are we going to, what do you need us to offer you to make this, take as much stress away from what we, we, we can? And what does your family need? And that's one of the things that we would do so that you are not carrying that because there's so much guilt involved with that, especially, um, especially for the women, I think, in this room because we're really good at thinking 
this terrible thing's happened and it's my fault and I've upset everyone, <laughs> even though it's actually happened to me. So um, we need to be doing more for families. As I said, partners, I know there are some partners that uh, leave or that leave but still are in the house and are not helpful. Um, and Kirsten was reminding me the other <laughs> last night about a woman who said, shall I not, I won't swear. <laughs> okay. When I was diagnosed, my husband fucking went to bed for four weeks. <laughs> don't you love that? Poor thing. No, I actually don't mean that at all because I do understand it has as big an effect. But yes. <laughs> and then we have the amazing partners who... One of the women in the other room, we were talking about um, waking up in pain with bone metastases and her husband turns up every morning with a cup of tea and a Panadol before she even wakes up. And, you know, they are the amazing um, uh, backbone and they can make it a, a manageable time or not a manageable time. What we know is, and we've researched this, the level of stress... Reported to be is reported to be comparable and in some studies higher for partners and significant others than for the person with cancer. And part of the reason for that is if you feel like this is out of control and you're not getting straight answers and you don't have you know concrete things to do, they feel that twice as much. And often we um, send the person home with a treatment regime. We say there's going to be all these um, s possible side effects. And our assumption is that, that your partner will help you with that. But we rarely say, how do you feel about that? Do you want any ideas about how you manage someone who can't stop vomiting or, you know, how that's going to feel for you? We don't. We're terrible. We set, we set you up. Um, and we need to understand that the impact is often just as big. Little ones. Um, when I first started in um, social work, I think there was still these beliefs that children don't feel things as much as adults do. Uh, there was a belief certainly in the cancer world that they actually don't feel pain as much as adults do. Um, but what we know is that uh, children, because cognitively they are the centre of the universe, that is how they're built, um, so when you give them news, they think, how does that impact on me? And they do that not because they're selfish, but that's how their brains are. And so when you don't tell them things, they absolutely know there's something going on in the house. Um, they will blame themselves. It is uncanny when I have sat with kids who, you know, three months down the track and the family has said to me, you know, they're fine, we haven't really told them what's going on. And I go, so what do you think's going on? They'll give me a kind of aversion, it's much worse probably than the reality because they've overheard or they've got a feeling or they think, you know, whenever I'm really noisy, um, mum goes to bed so, you know, she's not well and it's partly for me, whatever. So what we know is that kids can cope with lots of things if they're told about it straight and that requires us as the people that love them to do one of the hardest things in the world because we're kind of built to not upset our kids or the kids in our life you know it's the last thing we want to do and so we have to have this braveness that comes from love that says I need to sit down and tell you what's going on um, and let you know I'm here for you and um, so are these other people and you're going to have questions you need to come to me um, and we're going to go through this together um, and they will probably be the ones that say so are you going to die you know, when no one else is actually being able to say that out loud, but it's the, the child that kind of brings it up and you're like, <laughs> and you say, well, no, I've got treatment and, you know, we're doing this and this. But, but avoiding it um, is not the kindest thing to do and we know they need to be involved. Um, one of the most common experiences that I hear is that there was at least one person in the life of someone who has cancer, who they were sure would have been there for them and they weren't. They would have absolutely believed, if something bad happened to me, I know she or he will be there and actually they weren't. And it's one of the, it's, it's a grief that is really hard. Um, we thought that if, I'm, I'm assuming this is 
uh, women friendships. It might be a family member. But we thought being 14 was complicated with friendships of, with women. Doesn't get any easier. Doesn't hurt any less. Um, and it's, it is something that's really common and it happens and it hurts and we should just be open about it. And we know that it's because of a whole lot of reasons as to why that person right now can't face what you're um, going through. But that doesn't take away from how hard that is. We also know that most people have at least one person who they just never would have thought was going to be there and they've been incredible. You know, the neighbour who you only ever said hello to, who comes and takes your washing every week. Um, it's part of the emotional roller coaster that happens and it's important to acknowledge it. So we need to embrace, obviously, the people who are around during the really tough times and acknowledge that there is certainly a feeling of really missing the old me with um, when I had more peace of mind and acknowledging that. Um, but I'm going to talk now about some of the, the things that can be helpful. And... I feel like we maybe should stand up and have another stretch. Can I get you to do that? I'm sorry. I can see that it's warm in here. <sighs> and it coming up for lunch. It'll be worse for the person after lunch, can I say? <laughs> it is. Could you want to then have a nap? Have a bit of a stretch. Cool. Thank you. Now let me go on with some, hopefully, some positive things. So anxiety is um, an incredibly common part of living with cancer or having someone you love live with cancer. And some of you may have experienced anxiety in your life before and some of you may never have and it's like, what the hell is this panic feeling that I feel? It's um, just so understandable when you have everything that you know thrown up in the air. Anxiety is actually about uncertainty, which is you know, a part of living with cancer and times powerlessness. So actually looking at what strategies I can do is going to reduce my, um, my anxiety, even though you might not be able to get all the uncertainty taken away. So my first how to cope tip is that it's really, impo really important to acknowledge the emotional distress that this feeling, this um, experience has. You are a normal person under an extraordinary um, circumstance. And so anyone that might suggest that you should be positive, um, and if you were really strong, you'd be positive, and if you're not careful, you know, if you're not positive, we're not sure what that's going to mean, have no idea what they're talking about because actually it's the most understandable reaction to a situation of having cancer or having a loved one have cancer is that you're going to have times when that actually feels terrible. Um, so it's really important for you to acknowledge the distress. Um, finding out that you might need some support with that distress is totally understandable. And actually, we know what to do with anxiety and depression so much better now that it's silly to sit with it and not actually ask for help. The second one, um, and this was kind of mentioned this morning, is to focus on now. So one of the really common things we do as human beings is that we think ahead. And um, that becomes really dangerous territory when you're living with uncertainty. So whereas when I go down the rabbit hole, usually you know when you're kind of trying to go to sleep at night can be a particularly bad time, and you think, you know, what's going to happen? Can I plan for Christmas? Or will I be here when this person does this? Or am I going to be well enough because I'm in treatment for this particular thing? And that's when we go into this abyss of worry. And the reality is no one has an answer to that. And I think it was said this morning, actually none of us, even I, don't know what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow. And so if I get a, a call from someone that I'm working with and they say... Um, that they are really full of anxiety that week and they don't think they can get through it and it's all too much. And if I say to them, can you, do you think you can get through to lunchtime today? And they'll go, well, yeah, okay, well, let's focus on getting through to lunchtime or let's focus on getting through to this weekend. And yes, you might not be able to plan a holiday in three months' time, but maybe in the next month you can plan a couple of days away. Often you can plan between um, scans and doctor's visits. That's okay. 
but it changes all the time what we can actually cope with. So rather than going, how can I cope with this whole staircase, I go, can I cope with this step, this thing right now? And it takes practice and we have to actually bring ourselves back. So as soon as we're going on to the, what about this, what about this, what about this, we pretend we have a, um, a remote control and we go changing the channel, bringing myself back. We have to physically kind of do it in our head. So decide what time frame you can cope with at the moment. It changes all the time and only focus on that and really work on only focusing on that. Second one is um, don't believe everything you think. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, um, some of you might have heard of it. There's heaps online about it. It's really a very powerful process to learn about. It's really good for uncertainty, living with uncertainty. And it's about us understanding how our minds often go to automatic negative thoughts and then we get all these responses from that. So I'm going to give you an example. So a situation happens. So we might be having a fine day, everything's okay today. We go on Facebook and we see that some of our friends went out without us. And so we're feeling fine and then we hear that this, this has happened. And we have a thought and this step of having the thought is often unconscious to us. And I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. But the thought is I really don't mean anything to them. Um, and then I might feel down and then I might get a headache, um, and my shoulders might get tight. I need to, I just, I just did this in the room before and I still have to do it. My shoulders go up like this, so I need to lower them. Um, and you might withdraw and not contact your friends. Okay, so the thing that happened was this event and it's our thought that threw us into these feelings. What we need to do is to learn how to challenge those thoughts. So let me give you a different example. You notice your shoulder hurts when you're hanging out the washing. So the thought, and this can be subconscious, but we start to feel a tension and it's because somewhere in our mind we went, oh, it's probably the cancer or something's not working or whatever. So we then have a physical reaction, whatever your physical reactions are when you're um, anxious, but, you know, heart rate might start going up, might feel tense, um, might go to bed and withdraw and avoid going <coughs> and seeing the doctor because actually this is too scary and I can't cope. If I was to come back, and so what often happens is we're going along in the day and suddenly we've kind of got a headache and we're feeling really tense and we have to go, when did I start feeling that? And we go backwards because all that often happens subconsciously. I was out what, hanging the washing, that's right, I had a bit of a pain, oh, I probably thought that. I have to challenge that because these automatic negative thoughts are not helpful or useful. So... I go back to the thought and I go, okay, actually there's lots of reasons why my shoulder might be sore. Um, I need to address it and move on. So I might manage some of the physical things that are happening. So I'm going to breathe. I'm going to lower my shoulders. I'm going to have a think about, you know, how I'm holding my body. I might take a Panadol or something. Um, and then I go, okay, ha what do I need to do with this instead of hiding from it or being upset from it? I'm going to maybe give myself two days of heat packs and Panadol and I'm going to make sure that if it's still happening then I'll call the doctor and I'll go and get it checked out. Um, suddenly I'm not worrying about it anymore. Now these happen all the time. We get panicked and we kind of go, I'm not sure what just happened and we have to go back. Here's another one. You're due for another scan. How much do we love the lead up to another scan? Not. Um, so again... We might have skipped the thought, but we're tense and we're stomping around the house and we're upset with everything everyone's done and why they didn't put something away and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, we might be unable to sleep and we're snapping at each other. There could be tension in the house because of this. You can feel like you're not coping. And actually what's happening is that there is fear 
around going for another scan and what it's going to show. We, it's called scanxiety. It's a thing. Everyone feels it. So what can you do to fix it? You can stop and think, OK, why am I feeling tense? It's probably because the scan's coming up. And what am I going to do about it? Um, I'm changing the thought by telling myself this is a scheduled part of my care. They do it at these time points because I've done a whole lot of research and know that that's the time points I need to do it. And of course it's going to make me anxious. So every I know that on the weeks that I'm going to have scanned, the day before I'm going to be in a bad mood. And I need to either, I've probably got it up here, um, plan for the lead up. I need to either tell everyone around me, stay away from me because I've got a scan tomorrow or I really need to get busy on those days or please, you know, forgive me for being snappy because I've got a scan coming up. So suddenly there's this thing that we have no control over but we can take hold of it. Okay. Number four. Let go of the things that you can't control. This sounds like a really simple thing and yet, um, you know, it's like if you've got a wedding coming up and you hear it's going to rain and you go, oh my God, I really hope it doesn't rain. And then, you know, two days before, it's looking like it's going to rain. You get more tense. I can't believe my luck. It's going to rain for the wedding. It's terrible. Then, you know, leading right up to it, you've just gotten more and more tense. You have no control over the rain. So maybe what you do is go, if it rains, we have plan B. I can't control that. Because, gee, we can get tense about stuff that we have no control over. So... Um, the need to be perfect is one of the things we have no control over. Um, Self-doubt and comparison, um, living up to the expectations of others, the need to please everyone, um, all of those things. We need to learn to let go of those things because we need to narrow down to what are the things I can control, like focusing on now, looking after my... Um, mental health, those things, I can control those. There are things I can do, but there's some things that are out of my hands and it's time that I let go of it. How everyone else is responding to my cancer diagnosis is not something you can control. You have to hand that to them. Number five. Um, oh, I just skipped that. Let me go back. So I did a PhD on the role of meaning in adjustment to advanced cancer. And um, I asked, did interviews with a whole lot of people who were living with advanced cancer, and I just asked them kind of what their days were like. And what they talked about was that they moved in and out of these three domains, if you like. Suffering, coping and meaning. So to give you an example, um, someone who maybe has um, bone pain, they wake up in the morning and they've got pain and they think, I can't manage anymore, this is horrible, I'm waking up and I've got bone pain. Um, and then their partner or someone comes in and says, take some pain medication, get up, let's have a warm shower. They, get, they do that, this is, that's the coping. So they're waking up and feeling worried is the suffering. They do something about it is the coping. And then someone says it is such a beautiful day, let's go for a walk. So a friend rings them and they go, God, I'm loved, and they're in meaning. Now this is what we all do all the time. So we move in and out of these all the time. This is just life. But what happens when we're faced with these additional stresses is that we usually stop focusing on the meaningful things. And we know now that we can measure it and that is what gets us through. <coughs> And they're really simple things in life and we often, this is the time when we forget it. Um, and when we looked at what holds people together during these moving in and out, it was having physical symptoms managed, having more meaning in life and connection with other people. Um, that's like the, the antidote. So um, when I was living in Melbourne, we were living in the inner city, but I grew up on the coast in Tassie. And uh, when my father had a heart attack, my husband got in the car and drove me to the beach in Melbourne. I've got to say, they're not really beaches. You know, if you've been in Tassie or probably around here, that's a beach. But anyway, it was a nice thought. But he knew that that's what I needed. You know, there's a whole lot of things he could have said or done, but he knew I needed to be sitting by the beach. It's because it's these meaningful things that actually keep us going. So there are things like um, the pursuit of little meanings the fascination with nature, how we can just be 
really um, fulfilled when we've been through trauma and we see an amazing sunset or we sit in the bush and we go, God, you know, I, I forgot to look at these for a while in life, but actually these things are really important. Doing what you love. Now, it might be stage diving um, for you. My, my daughter's a hip-hop artist, so I, I end up in all sorts of dives of places these days listening to music. Um, but it's that feeling that that guy feels. Um, now, you, you might be happy to know that I also found... There's a jetty you can jump off around here. <laughs> How many of you have jumped off this jetty? Yeah, you have. That's fantastic. In Launceston, um, there's a gorge, if you don't know if you know it, and at the gorge there are different rocks. They all have names. There's daddies, there's mummies, there's very different ones. And there's like these, the water is, you know, they haven't found the bottom of the water there. So people jump off, kids jump off um, and at differing levels. There's a couple of bridges as well. Um, anyway, I'll try not to think about that. But what it is, it doesn't have to be that you can jump off something. It's, it's that feeling. You might get that feeling from sitting in your garden and the sun shining on your skin and you're with some friends or you've actually got a whole afternoon with a book or whatever it is. We know the things that make us feel like that, but we often don't you know put them into our life and go these are I need to make sure I do more of that um, because that's going to rebalance things we know kindness means so much when um, we're going through trauma the simple beauty in the world connection 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 if you don't have enough people in your life it doesn't mean these are people that know your deepest thoughts it could be someone that you just do a, a painting class with or you, that you go on park runs with or that just have more people in your life because connection we know we've measured it really really matters and it's not about how many people um number five is check in right now with what you need and i could do this i could chat with you in two months time and they might be different things but it's important to to kind of have times when you stop and you check um, what are you doing to take care of yourself right now? And don't go, oh, yeah, that's a good thought. I actually mean, think about it. What are you doing to care for yourself right now? Are you getting the best medical care? Like, are there questions you just don't feel like you're getting answered? How do you get that answered so you're not carrying that around? Are you seeking and finding support, encouragement from um, loved ones around you? Are you asking for that or do you need to do more of that? And is there something more among the many possibilities open to you that might enhance and enrich your life right now? One of the ways to manage whilst the uncertainty is happening and whilst there's things happening that we wish weren't happening is that we, um, we structure in that good stuff. We get it rebalanced and it happens alongside it. It doesn't make it all okay, but it strengthens um, how we are in life. And allow yourself permission to not be brave all the time. Courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow, um, which is really important just to give yourself a break and go, you know what, had a great plan today. I was going to do all those great things to myself and ring people and I didn't do any of them and that's okay, I'm going to try again tomorrow. That's just as just fine. So there's some take-home messages I want you to take. Acknowledge emotional distress, own it, go, of course I'm distressed. I've had a traumatic experience in my life and I'm not going to be distressed all the time but there are some days when I'm distressed. Live with it. Um, focus on now. Um, and that can be right down to, you know, I'm feeling very out of control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on, I'm going to get up and make a cup of tea. I'm going to think about the cup. I'm going to think about listening to the hot water when it goes in the cup and dangling the tea bag and actually what it tastes like to drink. I'm going to stop. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to go into the garden. I'm actually going to have a look around. I'm going to bring things right back to now. Um... Challenge your thoughts when they're being really unhelpful. Um, identify, oh, sorry, let go of the things you can't control. Identify what is meaningful to you and focus on that. And if there's some really meaningful things that you haven't done for a while, it's time that you did them. 
check in with what you need right now and do that regularly and allow yourself permission to not be brave sometimes. And that's it. <laughs> Now, I think we've got time for a couple of questions, but I know this is often time of day where people are less likely to ask questions, which never, which Carrie always takes on board very well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But my one is, um, how do you know, we, we had a just bit of discussion with Michelle White mm -hmm. around um, how treatment can trigger depression. Mm -hmm. how, how do you know the difference between just feeling not yourself, yep. to depression. Yep. So um, the clinical answer to that is that you feel down more than you feel up and that that lasts for more than two weeks. So on paper, that's what it is. Um, but what I would say is certainly, you know, and especially, hmm, I was going to say if it's new to you, but some of you may have had depression in your life years earlier and you go, I know what this is. If that happens, then go, I need to speak to someone. Um, but if it is concerning you, I kind of think having to deal with feeling really down for two weeks is too long when I think about trauma. So it's about you feeling like I, I'm just not right and I can't shake this and I've tried a few things. I've rung a friend, I've gone for a walk, I've done some exercise. I just have this feeling of hopelessness, helplessness. Um, I think you need to, to reach out and it might be at the cancer centre, it might be your GP, um, because we know what to do with it. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it is that you have got um, a clinical depression that you might have had anyway or you have what we would call, um, what's the term? A depression that's brought on by a difficult situation, there's a term for it. Um, I don't think that matters. Uh, you will still benefit from... Uh, support and treatment but it's usually about how bad it feels and for how long and if you're not getting breaks so that you know the low times are just um, more than the the up times um, but I think understanding that that's a really common part of having not just having a big life experience like cancer but the treatment menopause all of that stuff there's a whole lot of chemical things happening in us um, and sometimes they are the chemical things and so doing all of those things that I said may not actually be enough and you actually need to also have um, some medical treatment. I just, there is no benefit in sitting in it, in sitting in that dark place. It's not helpful and sitting and having the dark, being in the dark place doesn't mean anything about how strong you are or how someone else might be coping better than you. Um, it's just not a, not okay for people to be sitting in it. So I don't know if that was a straight answer, but yeah. There's a question down here. You didn't mention uh, very much about survivor's guilt. Yeah. Do you want to tell me what your thoughts are about it? You don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. I I've had a. I've had an awesome journey. I've really, okay. I've had a wonderful time. Yep. I've ended up better off than I started. I've yep. enjoyed the journey. I've just, yep. I feel, um, hmm. yeah. No, that's really, thank and you I'm, for I'm bringing I'm very it conscious up. of the fact that that's, I'm really blessed to have had that experience. Yep. And sometimes I feel I should hide my joy mm -hmm. in the situation yeah. to make others feel mm. better. Um, but I don't like doing that because yeah. I am, Joyful. Yes, and this is your experience. Um, Leslie, thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that one of the things that probably most people in this room would say is that they have got benefits out of this experience that, um, you know, they wouldn't have asked for this being the reason, but um, there are absolutely big things, good things that come out. Um, and one of the things is, you know, for women it's often like I can say no to things or I know how loved I am or... Um, I have looked after people my whole life and actually I'm going into the amazing um, Coffs Harbour Hospital and I'm feeling, you know, wrapped up in love and I haven't felt that before. Um, so there, there should be no guilt about that and, but I understand when I stand here and I go, 
suffering stuff and because I, and I bring that up because I worry that there isn't an acknowledgement of the hard times that some people go through. Um, our goal is in all the work that we've done and that have happened you know in the last 30 years is to get to a place where you are where you can have something big like cancer happen and we've got a whole lot of treatments and we've got good services and we've got information and even though it's a bit of a shock and it maybe changes what you were doing at the moment, um, you go, okay, I know what I'm doing, they know what they're doing around me um, and I'm cared for. That is your, what we're hoping to get to so that everyone has that experience. Um, and I think that's great. And it's as much about you owning that journey as someone who's pretending that they're okay and they're not saying it. Um, both of you have the right um, to say that and what joyous hope you would you give others for knowing that you can have that. So I thank you for being brave and bringing that up. That's important. And I think it is very real, the survivor's guilt and um, if you are connected in communities, which often in rural areas we're much more connected, um, which is a great thing, but it, it can also mean that you do have people who survive and people who don't. Yep. And um, that mm -hmm. can be really difficult mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. particularly when, if you're in groups or friendships where one, you know, you, your mm -hmm. breast cancer is completely fine and theirs is not. So I think it's kind of acknowledging it yeah. and then helping to um, put strategies in place. Yeah, so and I think, you know, this is such a random thing. Mm -hmm. um, none of us ask for it and um, there's, whilst there's lots of things we can do and lots of great treatments, um, actually part of the anxiety is that it is random who's mm -hmm. going to do well with this treatment or not with that treatment. Um, and so it's really important not to take that on because, you know, just as much as... Um, the next person, you've had no say in, you know, this happening and maybe you doing well with treatment. Um, yeah. Um, so, one other question that's, I think it's our final one because lunch is outside, yes, um, is about anger. Because we see, um, we, we do see people go through anger yep. uh, at the system, yep. at friends, at... Um, what, what are some of the things we might do to manage mm. that anger? So I think it's really important to, uh, that's one of the, it's not an automatic negative thought, but it's one of the things where it's important to stop and go, okay, why am I angry? Because we might just feel really angry um, and, uh, and we might like avoid that person or we might whatever that brings out in us. What's important is to stop and go, okay, why am I angry? What, when does this come up for me? Is it that um, services, you know, I have to drive all the way to Sydney for things and that's not fair or is it that uh, I've already been through a whole lot of stuff and now this and that's not fair? Um, I need to actually look at what is making me angry um, and part of it is acknowledging that's actually fine um, and part of it is do I need to do something about that? So is it that... Um, my friend who nothing bad ever happens to and, you know, their grandchild's just had a baby and their family's going on a holiday and it's all that sort of stuff and they don't get it. You know, then maybe I need to actually question whether it's helpful for me to be around that person. I'm making a whole lot of assumptions here about things that might make you angry. Karen, have you got one that you want to share with me? A thing that you're really angry about? You don't have to. No, yeah. Um, but that's what I would say. I think any strong emotion that you're having, um, I'm really panicked whenever I go near the hospital or I'm really angry every time I see this person or I'm really angry that this person hasn't contacted me, um, then go, okay, am I going to deal with that or I'm going to put it aside? But what I'm not going to do is just keep feeling it. I'm going to actually go, let's break this down. Let's talk. I want to talk to someone about it to work out what is having, bringing that feeling up for me because I don't really like carrying it around with me anymore. So maybe I need to say something to that person, maybe I need to move away, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I think it's about unpacking it, yeah. 
I, I remember a, a, um, one of these sessions, someone stood up and said that they'd been coached on how to, uh, you know, clean out their wardrobe. And they decided to do a friendship clean out after cancer. <laughs> and they felt very good. That's cool. And just yeah. went, I am not taking on your anymore. <laughs> uh, so, you know, maybe we can all clean out our wardrobes and mm. our friendships. Yeah, Bring those closer to us. The other thing um, I did just want to pick up on the scanxiety. So Lynn Swinburne, who you saw in the videos, was our founder. So she was diagnosed in 1993. And we had worked out as her team. We're a very small team, seven staff. And every year, Lynn <laughs> just seemed to be really annoying. And it wasn't until it kind of clicked a couple of years later that the executive team were like don't go near Lynn in February <laughs> and sure enough it's when she was having her scans and she had no idea of what was happening in the office so we then put it into our diaries under a hidden name <laughs> and everyone knew not to go to Lynn in the week or two weeks leading up with any decision to be made because it was just <laughs> we only took happy things to Lynn in those two weeks <laughs> yeah. and she had no idea but it was the way we were managing her so I think sometimes it's very obvious to the people around yes. you and sometimes <laughs> yeah. we probably should have held the mirror up to her and said hey yeah. this is what's happening yeah. um, but you know that's the friends and workmates we want isn't it yeah. that they notice and they just go we're going to make sure we're it's only happy times. Yeah. We definitely weren't asking for any budget expenditure at that time. I'll tell you that for, tell you that for nothing. So it is time for lunch. Um, please get around and meet new people. Uh, but firstly, thank you to Carrie. Thank you. And I'm around. If, yeah. if that's brought up anything for you or you wanted to come and say that wasn't my experience at all or that was, just come and grab me because I'm around. Thank you. Let's go and have lunch. Yeah.